country, 15 or 20 miles away from the railroad station, you had to get up before dawn to catch the 9.30 train. You harnessed up the reliable horse, and for the next two hours, the carriage went creaking down the old familiar road, while the countryside moved slowly past. If you were leaving the farm for good, to go to the city, you had mixed feelings on that long ride to the station. It's not easy to pull up roots and start a new kind of life. You saw the faces of old friends as you passed their house, waving goodbye, and you felt sad at leaving them. But you saw, too, how old and tired they looked, worn out by hard work, locked on the land. A woman looked 50 before she was 35 with all she had to do. In a way, you were glad you were leaving. You passed the old schoolhouse where you'd gone as a kid, and you remembered the long miles you'd walked morning after morning to get there. That final run to get inside before the bell stopped clanging. You passed the doctor's buggy drawn up in front of someone's house and you'd remember the terrible night your mother lay upstairs in the bedroom, sick, and the long hours of waiting for the doctor to come. The roads were bad that night. When he finally arrived, there was nothing he could do anymore. After that, you never saw the doctor's buggy without wondering if he'd gotten there in time. You passed the church, too. But you knew you were not leaving God behind. He would be with you in the uncertain days that lay ahead. Still, there were good times to remember as well as bad, and by the time you reached the station, you wondered if you were making a mistake. Some people might call you a darn fool to leave a fine farm and go running off to the city where it was noisy and dirty and full of pickpockets and swindlers and women who painted their faces. But there were things you wanted to do couldn't get done on the farm. If you were interested in machinery, for instance, or wanted to tinker with engines that ran on gasoline, the country was no place for you. You had to go where other men were doing this kind of thing. Train was late, of course. You could have slept another half hour. stood and looked down the empty tracks, waiting. Somewhere out there beyond the horizon lay the city where your destiny waited. The people who lived in the city stayed in the city. They walked the hard pavements till their feet ached. If a person were well healed, he took a cab. If a nickel was all he could afford, he took a streetcar and got there an hour later. The fastest thing in town was the fire engine. In the 
the good old summertime, the streets got hot as ovens. Vegetables and people wilted under the blazing sun, and the kids got hard boiled. Everybody panted and swelted and longed to get away from the clanking thunder of the elevated trains and the clatter of wagon wheels on cobblestones. Far uptown lay the ballpark. And if you went for a long boat ride down the bay, you finally arrived at an amusement park where there were roller coasters. Shoot the chutes. Camels to ride. And a real beach where a kid could get to swim in the ocean. But it took the better part of a day to get there and back. So you settle for the nearest fire hydrant on your block. Bicycles were all the rage. On Sunday afternoons, you could pedal out past the city limits and see real trees and grass and hear a bird sing. That was fun. As long as your legs held out, you could go wherever you wanted. Right up to the end of the road, that is. A few miles out of town, the paving ended, and from then on, bicycling was no pleasure. A lot of people accepted the end of the road and turned back. But the bicycle wheels had a greater destiny. In Detroit, a man named Henry Ford, who had left the farm and come to the city to tinker with machinery, was making what he called a quadricycle. It looked like a buggy, only it had no shafts for a horse to be harnessed to. I was going to come from a gasoline he'd made himself. He did everything himself working nights and holding down a daytime job with the Detroit Illuminating Company. It took a long while to make this machine, but Henry Ford stuck to it, and finally it was ready. One winter's night, he pushed it out for its first trial run. dark, empty streets ran the little quadricycle. Past the sleeping houses, ghost-like and unreal, flitted the shape of things to come. If anybody had waked up and looked out the window, he probably would have thought he was still dreaming. That night, history was made. The street was never the same again. It didn't happen overnight. The going was rough for those early cars on the American road. We should pause to remember and admire not only the adventurous men who kept on making automobiles, but the reckless few who had courage enough to drive them. Some people thought that the sail wagon had a more promising future than the automobile. Built like an ice boat on wheels, it could hit over 50 miles an hour if the wheels stayed on. Of course, it took a land-going sailor to operate it, and on a public road, it really stopped traffic. While people were still letting the wind blow them in various directions, Men like Henry Ford were putting their faith in the gasoline engine. He built a big one and 
put it in a racing car called the 999. It was a huge, heavy monster, and it spent most of its time in the shop getting tuned up. Nobody at the time probably realized it, but the 999 had a prophetic look. This was no horseless carriage. It was long and low and powerful, built for speed. In a crude but unmistakable way, it forecast the shape of cars to come. On October 25, 1902, Barney Oldfield set a world's record in the 999. He drove it a mile a minute, and this phrase ushered in a new era. Cars now became a more and more frequent sight, particularly in cities. By 1903, there were more than a thousand automobile manufacturers in the United States. And in that year, the Ford Motor Company was founded. The first payroll didn't take much bookkeeping. The first car of the new little company was called the Model A. It had a two-cylinder, eight-horsepower engine, and it could go 30 miles an hour. It sold for $850, a lot of money in those days, and its owners were chiefly in the upper brackets. It was smart and fashionably designed with a door in the rear like a pony cart. And it cranked from the side, a good safety measure designed to prevent the cranker from being knocked flat and run over if the car started prematurely. Everybody admired it. But only the more daring could be persuaded to ride in any kind of a motor car. The farmer was a forgotten man during this early period. He saw occasional cars go by on the rough roads, but these strange mechanical contraptions seemed out of place in the country. They were for city people, not for him. He kept on grooming his old reliable horse and waited. And suddenly one day, it appeared. It was called the Model T. It had a four-cylinder, 20-horsepower engine and a planetary gear that defied the laws of science. Maybe it didn't look classy, but it could take a beating on rough country roads and still get you there. It was a farmer's car, built by a farmer. There was only one thing wrong with it. It cost $850. Millions of citizens looked at the Model T and licked their chops. There it was, the car of their dreams, but they couldn't afford it. Back in Detroit, Henry Ford wondered how he could bring the price of the Model T down to where everybody could buy it. He figured that the more cars he made and sold, the cheaper he could sell each one. And he went to work on this idea. In those days, each car was built from the frame up on stationary wooden horses. There was a different crew for each car, and the same crew stayed on the car until it was finished. That meant duplication of effort and a lot of time wasted. So they tried moving the men from car to car. Each man had a special job to do, and as soon as he finished it, he moved on to the next car and did the same thing there. That was better, but it still took 12 and a half hours to assemble each Model T. Henry Ford watched it for a while, then he had an inspiration. Instead of moving the men past the cars, why not move the cars past the men? So on one hot August morning, they tried it that way. A husky young fellow put a rope over his shoulder, and Henry Ford called, let's go. And 
at that very moment, as the workmen began to fasten the parts onto the slowly moving car, the assembly line was born, a technique that was to revolutionize mass production all over the world. Once they found that the idea would work, they began to improve it, refine it. They rolled the chassis down a single line of track, pushing it from crew to crew. And the more expert they became at this new method, the faster the cars came off the assembly line, and the price of the Model T began to drop. They tried the same idea on all the various parts of the car, and created what were called sub-assemblies. Each man on the line became a specialist. He did one thing, and he did it perfectly, then passed the work along to the next man. Minute by minute, production was winning the battle against wasted time and wasted effort. Parts were fed to the workmen by gravity slides so they wouldn't have to stop and wait for new parts. Then they put the parts on moving conveyor belts. And this was a great step forward because now they could regulate the flow of work and keep it moving at a constant rate of speed. And the conveyor belts grew longer and more complex as they moved the work from place to place in the huge shops. They became fantastic masterpieces of planning and engineering. But the battle against wasted time and wasted effort was being won. The cars began coming off the assembly line at the rate of one every 40 seconds. And what Henry Ford had foreseen happened. Mass production and the assembly line drove the price of the Model T down from $850 to $300. Now everybody could have one. What a wonderful feeling it was to own your own car. The Sunday afternoon drive became a national pastime. Bouncing along like a boat in a choppy sea, jolting your teeth out every time it hit a bump. Mom would keep saying, Papa, don't drive so fast. And when you suddenly met another car coming the other way on those narrow roads, oh boy, that was a thrill that stood your hair right up on end. Just being able to drive a car was enough, but pretty soon the novelty wore off and people began to get angry at the bad roads. So they started to make the roads better. In every state all across the nation, men and machines went to work. Rutted mud gave place to smooth ribbons of pavement, wide enough for two cars to pass each other. 
and the roads became longer. They pushed out in every direction. And down every road ran the Model T, panting and quivering, always eager to go farther. an interesting thing began to happen. People from the cities began riding out into the country, and people from the farms began going to the city, and whole sections of the population began to get acquainted with each other for the first time. No road maps in those days. You got lost, the kindly natives would give you directions so complicated you couldn't find your way home with a compass. Everything was down the road a piece. If you got lost, you stayed lost. It became a part of the American scene. It took the housewife to market. It brought the doctor to his patients in time to save their lives. It saved time and speeded up business. Filling stations sprang up by the thousand and a whole new industry in gas and oil was created. Not only did it save time, it gave the average citizen a wonderful new way to spend the time he saved. Now for the first time Americans were able to travel inexpensively across their own country in their own cars and see the grandeur of their inheritance. They could visit the great national parks which had been created for the people, but which so few people had ever had an opportunity to see. Now the whole family could get away from the noise and the heat of the city. People could go camping over a weekend and be back to work Monday morning with renewed energy. They could go to the mountains, or if they preferred the beach, the faithful tin Lizzie would carry them to the sea's edge. There were many new images in the people's minds now things they had seen along the American road. Wonderful things they would never have been able to see at all without the motor car. There was a new look in people's faces, a look of discovery and wonderment and pleasure. A new world had been opened up for them. The nation took the Model T to its heart. People called it a flipper, made jokes about it, loved it. They said it could go anywhere except in society. Hollywood comedians had a field day with it.
Model T was more than a motor car. It was the symbol of an industrial revolution. For mass production and the assembly line, we're now able to bring the price down on all sorts of products, put them within everyone's reach. Mass production also created thousands of new skills, new jobs at higher wages. And under this powerful stimulus, the nation's economy expanded enormously. What about the man who was chiefly responsible for all this? What was he like? Let's take a look at the family album. Here he is at his home, Fairlane. Walking with his wife, Clara, through the garden. Laughing with a friend over a cartoon of himself. On the ice-covered pond with his grandchildren. Here he is, back on the land, tinkering with one of the old steam engines. He was always wondering how he could take the burden of work from the back of the farmer and put it onto the machine. Maybe it was at times like this that the idea of the tractor came to him. The tractor was the realization of one of his oldest dreams. Here he is in his office, having a conference. The man whose five dollar day startled the industrial world. This is a family scene. His son Edsel starting out with some friends on a transcontinental trip, getting a big send off. A drive like this was quite an adventure in those days. He liked to dance country dances. A grandchild, Henry Ford II, showing his grandchild a baby bird with Mrs. Edsel Ford watching. Still the farmer, teaching his grandchildren, Henry II and Benson Ford, to love the soil. On anniversaries and other state occasions, he'd get out the old quadricycle and drive it around Fairlane with his wife, Clara. What memories it must have brought back. Sometimes he liked to go camping with some of his old friends. The bearded man is John Burroughs, the naturalist. On the right is Harvey Firestone. He still knew how to swing an ax. Had his own ideas about cooking, too. That's Edison in the background. Vigorous men with vigorous minds and healthy appetites. They used to have a saying, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Whatever he did, Henry Ford always kept a certain rustic simplicity, a rugged quality that nothing could alter or soften. Burroughs had always looked down his beard at the Model T, called it a noisy device that frightened the birds. But finally, even Burroughs overcame his prejudices. The man behind the legend. These are men whose ideas changed our way of life and made it better. Father and son. 
They walk side by side, reviewing the past, planning the future together. How quickly it all had happened. In less than 25 years, Henry Ford, he personified the American credo of individualism and freedom of enterprise. He will long be remembered. As the American road became better, the cars that drove along it began to change. They became larger and heavier, lower and longer. The highway had become an extension of the city street, and people began to demand boulevard comfort and luxury in their transportation. Balloon tires and shock absorbers took the roughness out of driving. Interiors were the Ritz. Some even had a crystal vase to hold a single elegant flower. Henry Ford saw the trend and began making the Lincoln, one of the finest and most luxurious cars in the world. Alongside of such grandeur, the old Model T began to look more and more like a country cousin. The times had changed, and the car that had changed them was no longer needed. Henry Ford decided to stop producing it. In May, the 18 millionth Model T came out of the plant. And the assembly line closed down forever on the world's most famous car. From then on, the old flivver began to disappear from the roads. As old cars were turned in, they were taken back to the plant. There they were scrapped. Their steel was salvaged for use in the new models. in a while, a car would balk at the mouth of the furnace as though in a last effort to save itself. The Model T died hard. Although the Model T began to fade from the American scene, the impetus and the new direction it gave to our way of life did not stop there. It gathered momentum that carried us through the gay 20s. The grim depression of the 30s could not stop the powerful forces that had been in motion. Lessons learned from the assembly line and mass production helped us to win a long and terrible war. Years ago. 
The road has bridged the gulf between city and country. Their ways of life have mingled, and both share the fruits of progress equally. Machines have taken the burden of work from the back of the farmer. No longer do the women on the farms grow old before their time. And the people of the cities have been able to move out into quiet communities full of sun and fresh air that seem almost like living in the country. The old country schoolhouse has vanished and the energy of the children is no longer wasted in walking miles to get there. The worker of today no longer has to live close to the plant that employs him. His home is in pleasant surroundings and he drives to work. Every car on the American road, every new building that towers against the sky is a sign of our progress towards a better way of life. But perhaps the most wonderful thing about the American road is the freedom it gives us. You've only to get in your car and start driving to feel it. The American road. What magnificent vistas open up before us as we travel along it. We have come a long way since the quadricycle and the Model T. In 50 short years, our whole way of life has changed. We have accomplished much, but the achievements to come will dwarf our own. The American road stretches ahead of us, always towards a new horizon. We are all traveling along that road, all moving forward towards an even better tomorrow. Thank you.